Francis, William Temple is one of those very interesting people in Anglican history. Could you introduce him to us? Yes, well, William Temple was uh, the most significant person, I think, in the history of 20th century Anglicanism in the first half of the century. Uh, and it has to be the first half of the century because he dies in 1944, uh, rather prematurely, it has to be said. Um, now, there are two particular things that I think are particularly worth emphasising about him. I would say that his legacy is, first of all, ecumenism, and secondly, a belief that Christianity has to be about social justice. Uh, perhaps I should also say that he was very active uh, writing philosophical theology, but not much of that gets read these days. So he was uh, academically active, but it's his, uh, his work um, making things happen, being involved in organisations, uh, and being a, a kind of ma a incredibly energetic figure that's really at the heart of his legacy. We leave aside the philosophical theology because that's not, when, when, when we hear the, the name William, Wi William Temple, we don't link him with that. It's no. It may, maybe is the, the faith that be, befalls all of us as academics. Let's talk about William Temple and ecumenism, because I suspect that that may be the longest, uh, his greatest long-term impact. Mm. Well, he was, I suppose, at the r in the right place at the right time, uh, in that he uh, is involved in the first big ecumenical activity of the 20th century, which is the Edinburgh Missionary Conference in 1910. Mm. Uh, and that, because that gets together missionaries from all over the world, um, who then, after the First World War, realise that they're probably not going to convert the entire world to Christianity, but what they can do is try and get on a lot better with each other. Um, so he then uh, moves into uh, being uh, a kind of leading figure in the various ecumenical movements uh, and uh, congresses and conferences which happen in the 20 and 20s and 30s, which then culminate in the formation of the World Council of Churches in the 1940s. And I think one of the, the, the thing that I'd really want to say about him in terms of ecumenism is that he is an incredibly Anglican establishment figure, and I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. He's the son of an Archbishop of Canterbury, and he becomes Archbishop of Canterbury. So you, right. can't, you can't be more uh, you know, into the Anglican establishment than that, obviously. And yet he says in his enthronement sermon in 1942, um, that the really exciting thing that's happening in Christianity is that sense of it becoming a kind of worldwide brotherhood of people who um, recognise each other and acknowledge each other uh, and that uh, Christianity is actually seen as being much bigger than just being the denomination that you belong to, which was the kind of um, feeling that obviously was quite widespread up until that point. So he sort of opens it out from being the church equals the Church of England or the Roman Catholic Church or the Methodist Church to the church is actually a worldwide Christian society. So that's, I think that's his big... I'm going to come back to that point. in a moment, but can you tell me about why you think of him as a, as the, a characteristically Anglican figure? <laughs> well, he is, um, uh, he is born in the Bishop's Palace in Exeter because his father was the Bishop of Exeter. Uh, his father was 60 when he was born, and uh, his father was Frederick Temple, of course. Uh, very rapidly after that, he becomes, um, his father becomes Bishop of London, and so they move to London when he's about three. And then by the time William is 16, uh, Dad has become Archbishop of Canterbury. So he's brought up in the world with, uh, you know, bishops dropping in all the time, um, he just has that, I think he could have been insufferable actually, because he uh, you know, has that absolute sense of entitlement. He was very, very confident, very clever. Uh, so he had that sense of being you know, absolutely at the heart of everything. But one of my favorite stories actually about him is that shortly after he got married, um, he uh, invited the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Randall Davidson, who was his father's successor, on holiday, you know. And Randall Davidson, who was quite a sort of um, austere character and his rather formidable wife, Edith, 
know, I just would love to have been at their dinner table the day when they said, I don't think so, you know, are we going to be going on holiday with the temples? I really think not. So there was that sense when sometimes his precociousness could overcome <laughs> his sense of, you know, what was fitting. But he, you, couldn't, you couldn't have better Anglican credentials. And he also saw um, the Church of England as being full of sort of significant cultural reference points for, in for Englishness in a world which it clearly was in the pre pre Second World War. And of course, there's this awful thing about Temple is that you, you, you see him going up through the establishment and then he becomes Archbishop of Canterbury in 1942. And then two years. Yeah, he dies at 63. Yeah, it's, it, you, you, you feel that uh, it's one of those dreadful things that all the, whenever I read anything by Temple, I, I always have that terrible sense of the might have been. Yes. Well, and also the irony as well of a man who'd campaigned for holidays with pay and mm. taking time off. And he actually says in one of his things, the importance of holidays. Yes, that it's important to let yourself go a bit on holiday. Yes. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, classically, what does he do? He kills himself with overwork. Yes. So, um, yeah, and that is, uh, he, I mean, one of the things which really fascinates me about him is pondering how he would have uh, found the post-war world because um, I touched on social justice at the beginning of this. Obviously, his most famous publication is probably Christianity and Social Order, mm. uh, which comes out in 42, the same year as the Beveridge Report. And which in many ways you could see as a theological background to the welfare state. Exactly. An awful lot of the ideas that, that, that are normally given, as, given their parentage to the... To the um, to politicians, actually, he was saying several. He was he was actually saying them in the House of Lords, and he was writing about them yeah. beforehand. Absolutely, yeah, and that's of course why some people really don't like him because I mean, Corelli Barnett, the historian, um, in the 1980s, attacked Temple and said, you know, he was the person most responsible for post-war decline in Britain, it laid it, laid it very much at the door of William Temple because he'd advocated a world of welfare when, according to Barnett, what we should have had was a world of austerity and, um, you know, pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. Right. Yeah, well, OK. Can I take you back to uh, the, the Templin ecumenism? Because it seems to me that there are two models of ecumenism. The first model of ecumenism is let's go and find the origins of the source between two groups and let's find how we can reconcile this in, to, to the means of some sort of academic discussion and formulation of reconciliation statements. Lots of these things, lots of these debates have taken place over the years and they don't lead very far precisely because the idea of going back to a, some moment of unity presupposes that you're going back to some halcyon time. Mm. But there's another model of ecumenism, uh, far less academically driven, which is actually that, that I, as a Christian, recognize someone else. I recognize Christianity in them and they recognize it in me. And that that recognition is more important than the, than the distinctions between us. And Temple is one of the very first theological and church figures who actually adopts this yes, model of ecumenism. Mm. And it's partly to do with, um, I think, the fact that there was so much easier travel um, after the First World War. So they were, you know, they were meeting Swedish Lutherans. Um, he had good contacts in Germany, you know. And of course, Cardinal Hinsley is the other figure who belongs to that world, who also sadly um, dies around the same time, I think 1943. Yes. He was a kind of uh, proto-ecumenical figure in Roman Catholicism. Uh, and another, another of those awful things where it's the might have beens. Yeah, exactly. William Temple, Archbishop of Canterbury, man of the establishment, theological father of the welfare state, but also one of the proto-ecumenists. Francis, thank you for introducing him to us. Pleasure.